Hello, everybody. Welcome to my watercolor class. And today we're coming back to wet on wet technique. And uh, we have an image of Riggy Mountain Massive in Switzerland. So we've got loads of fabulous blues of the sky and the mountains, beautiful pine trees, Christmas trees, that lovely range. Uh, we'll practice how we can uh, work into them with wet and wet and the beautiful warmth of the fields in front of us. So we need to create the space and the depths uh, of this gorgeous landscape. And wet on wet is one of the lovely techniques which will help us to do that. So the plan for the session is we're going to start with a drawing uh, on our actual paper, and then we'll do some practices on the and color mixing on the spare paper, and we'll uh, have little recaps on wet on wet, how do we deal with paint and how much control we have with, with water. And then we'll do, <clears throat> we'll paint in stages. So we have much more control. Right, so I'll need my, uh, I'll need flat brushes from large size uh, to keep uh, our paper down. Uh, I've got different flat brushes in different sizes. And I also have a round brush where I can use some concentrated paint as well. So maybe not the mop brush today, if you've got one, maybe put it aside for the moment. Right, so leave, let's leave these brushes here. I'm gonna move my image a little bit more down and let's get started. So let's analyze the image all together. If I were to put uh, a line across it uh, horizontally halfway through, uh, most of my mountains are going to be below that line. So I'm going to have a lot of sky and not as much, uh, everything else is going to be at the in the lower part um, uh, of my paper. Now, if you want to bring the mountains tiny bit higher on the left-hand side, that will be fine as well. So let's find halfway through on my paper, or roughly halfway through on my paper, so this is not my line of horizon. This is more of a division of the paper to give me <clears throat> some balance. Okay, so I'm going to make my mountains just a little bit of extra taller. Now, there's not much of a sharp uh, edge for the distant mountains because there's some low clouds. But if you wanted to have a shape which might... Uh, give us more precise kind of locations. And then we can lose those uh, silhouettes, partially lose those silhouettes. That might be a good, uh, good chance to create beautiful clouds. I'm just gonna make in my lines a tiny bit darker so you can see them. If you keep your lines light, that that's will be wonderful. Nice and sketchy. Okay. Now I'm gonna come back to some more details in the mountains, but for now, all I'm interested was to find something above my horizon. Okay. And now let's have a look how much of that green field uh, mountain slope we have. I think if I divide it again, my photograph into half, so it's a quarter, so the highest part of the field is here, it takes a quarter of space, but then it just moves down a bit more here. Might just leave it now here on the side so you can see it. So it's gonna come back somewhere here. Where is um, more of a shallow part of the field is? Yes, yeah, so we've got a slope and the shallow end is probably going down. Uh, towards the slope of the mountain. And maybe the next higher point is not going to be as high as on the right-hand side, maybe a little bit lower. So if that's a quarter, if I'll make it a little bit lower. So that variety is always something we're looking for. Keep your lines light. But it's okay to sketch and have a number of lines and then remove the ones we don't want. 
Now that slope we create in almost like a very, very shallow V shape. It's where some of these uh, taller pine trees are gonna go from. Uh, so what I might do, I might place a couple of pointers where some of these pine trees are going to be as some of the vertical lines. So I don't need to do branches or anything else. Just need to find rough vertical lines for them. Okay. As they are in this kind of um, way. Maybe there will be another line of light coming in. Now, when we work in wet on wet, with watercolors, planning and kind of for light and dark for change of color is very important. What we're not planning are the minuscule details that something happens uh, as we paint. So that's where the practice comes in, right? So we've got the sky, we've got the field, the green field, now let's find, before we go into further trees, um, we can see a little bit of the lake. You might have not spotted it, but uh, the, the mountains are finishing. There is a little pale area, uh, which breaks the darkness down and kind of um, gives us an opportunity to link uh, the blue uh, of the lake with um, the water of the lake. Oh, so the sky color will be similar to some of the color for the water. So where is that going to be? Again, so if that is halfway through of my picture, maybe something above it. Okay, that's my halfway through. Maybe somewhere roughly, a little bit straight line. Because we're so high up, we're not gonna see much of the base of the kind of uh, uneven, uh, line of the shore, we'll see it much more uh, in the distance, more as a line. However, at the front, there are some uh, other, I think it's an island, uh, or perhaps would have been just a landmass, how it uh, covers part of that lake. Where it's going to be finishing, there's something darker above it. So my edges of that dark area is going to be somewhere here. So that's going to be my lake, something paler. Then it makes um, and then kind of gives us an understanding. So we're standing on the top, the slope is going down. And then something else raises up and again it goes uh, away. Now I'm not going to continue where it's going to be finishing because I'm going to have trees there and that's going to be all lost. Uh, but let's work a little bit more into the shapes of the mountains. Uh, for example, uh, this lovely pointy corner and a couple of very sharp edges uh, towards the right. Now, this mountain looks very central, okay? I quite like its darkness, but perhaps we can move it one way or the other way. I think left will be better than we've got kind of this range is coming together as well. So if I have something pointy going on here, maybe within its uh, silhouette, Maybe there will be a more darker tone. And what I don't want, I don't want it to look like a volcano, folks. It has got that little bit of a volcano shape, but it will look silly if we're not accurate, if we just might take too much attention. My intentions uh, is it's going to have a link to the other blues at the back, and it just will have a little bit of extra depth of darkness. Uh, but I'm not going to make it stand out as a, just a shape on its own. Um, 
and let's have a look at the almost upside down W quirky shape of the mountains here. Yeah, I can remove what's behind it, any of my lines. Oh, I had that horizontal line, which I was dividing my piece of paper with, so I can remove that as well. Okay. And then we can decide how much details we want to put on the silhouette of the mountains on the right. Or oh, this is maybe a two plane line, maybe I'll just make it a little bit more playful. Yes, it's a bit more complex uh, to see what it's actually is going to be there with the cloud because of the clouds. So make those decisions, maybe have a look at some of the ridges you can see, uh, maybe at the ridge here on the right hand side to give you an idea of what might be there. Quite like a little, another, uh, peak coming through here. Just need to be careful so they don't, yeah, they don't look overly silly. Sometimes we simplify the mountains and they don't look too realistic. Right, I think that's good. Um, and let's have a look at the sky. Now, if we keep that uh, plain as it is at the moment, it just kind of lets everything out. Our clouds almost have a swirl here, so they will keep everything staying within the picture. So I love that movement alongside the mountains going up. Again, use very light lines. I'm more doing the directional lines rather than doing the clouds themselves. It's um, And it comes in somewhere here with those big swirls. And we're going to be lifting a little bit of paint. So it's more directional. So when you pick up a sponge or tissue to lift color, what direction that's going to be, what type of movement. So instead of doing straight shapes, if you know that's a scooping uh, stroke, that will be the direction we want. I think that's better than this one. Look. Okay, now we can play with some of the clouds and a little bit of lifting um, over the mountains. Right, and now we need to have a look at uh, some of the pine trees. Now, we will have a little exercise on kind of building up the silhouette of the trees uh, because it's a beautiful rhythm. Some of them are taller, then going almost in a line down. How deep they're going, there's a single one, there's even further depths, kind of drop uh, into, this, into the uh, gap between them. Then they're building up to a very tall one, and again, just going a little bit up and down. So I quite like to find where this tall tree is going to be, perhaps between the ridge here. And I'm going to compare it with um, my trees on the right hand side, sorry, on the left hand side. Are they going to be too similar? Or maybe I need to um, let this tree to dominate and drop the height of these ones down. I'm also going to compare the height of these trees with another dark mountain. So that's that's not competing with anything. Is that one's going to be competing here? Yeah. So perhaps I even drop it lower. 
So that's my opportunity to, to check. So I'm kind of roughly giving myself a few pointers, just double checking my lines are straight. So my trees are not going to be falling down. And uh, I've pointed out one single tree standing out uh, below this distinctive dark mountain. Um, the reason I'm picking that shape, because again, I don't want it to be right in the middle of the mountain. If we plan it adv in advance uh, and move it perhaps more to the right, Uh, maybe it doesn't even need to be so high. Sorry, mine's gone too tall. Okay, maybe even shorter. We'll see. I think that should be okay. Maybe that one could go down a bit taller. And then we'll find the gaps and kind of that rhythm uh, later. Um, if you wanted to, you could have worked a little bit into the shape, almost like planning a V shape of how much volume we need to build up or how little. Yes, yeah, so they these shapes of um, uh, silhouettes of light are going to be, sorry, if I'll get up higher. Um, they still, I'm looking at the silhouettes of the trees, that kind of V shape and that almost W. Uh, so one is a bit higher, one is a bit lower. Volume of it uh, is easier to compare uh, while we're drawing. And then we can just bear it in mind. Maybe another one somewhere there. Um, they're not going to stay perfect, but if that's Depth is going to be further, and that will stay more shallow. That's more important. As when we paint, everything's going to be going so fast. We don't need to think as much that our helpers are there. So what I have here, so I have a few pine trees verticals. I have a little bit of pointers for how much space I'm going to see in between the pine trees. Don't think I need to do anything here um, because I've got one tree. I don't need to do anything above it. And that little gap is going to be more naturally done uh, with a brush. Uh, I will plant one more smaller tree here on the left hand side. Uh, there is a shape we can just about to see a light um, on a smaller tree here. So I'm going to exaggerate that light when we paint. So it's not going to be a dark hole in this corner. So I'll put a shorter tree trunk. And there will be a shadow from it, so we can work into the shadow as well. So then we definitely leave the space out um, for extra light. Something's going on for a shadow. If we don't draw it, we can do it with a brush, but that's an extra reminder. And I think we're done with the drawing. Double check that lines are straight so my, my um, trees are not going to be collapsing. Okay. Right, so now I have a spare paper for practice uh, and uh, we're going to start with some of the blues. 
Now I'm not going to only look at the sky. I'm also going to explore some of the colors for the mountains in one go. So let's just get our blues out and then we'll practice some of the techniques we can use. So I'm using a flat brush so I can just see the colors a little bit easier by using some flat strokes. So I'd love us to get all our blues out on the paper just to see what you have. So I have got some ultramarine here. Uh, sometimes just getting them all out. I think that's um, close to ultramarine, kind of more brilliant blue. They're a little bit close to, a bit too similar. So uh, I can perhaps illuminate one color. Okay, I've got some violet. So anything blue, uh, violet, close to those colors. Some of you might have loads of colors. Some of you might just have two or three. That's my cobalt blue, just much more diluted version in comparison to, let's say, more concentrated one here. And I'm looking for yellow blue or azure. I've got it here. Okay, that's much more stronger. I've got a little bit of um, almost like turquoise color in, in that. If I'll make it slightly darker, um, just got loads of uh, strong concentration of the same blue. Um, I have this super very, very, very pale um, color, but it's it has a little bit of white in it, but I don't often use it. It's almost like, um, um, like our ochre uh, has a lot of white, so this this is more opaque color for me. You don't have to have it. I'm just getting all my paints out in blues, looking for. Okay, I don't want another purple. I'm looking for maybe um, indigo. Okay, that's a black. Okay, I've got it. So if you have indigo, that's great. Indigo is our black. We can mix it with black and blue. I'll dilute it. It's got more of a grayish uh, look for it. Have we got anything else here? That's just black as well. And another color I'd love us to add to our blues is uh, emerald green. Now, emerald green on its own uh, is a little bit too bold, but mixing it with any blues will give us some beautiful turquoise colors. Oh, I've got another one here. I think that's another light, a more of a white version of a cobalt blue, one of those ones, but a little bit stronger version of it. So in a way, I could group my colors, my blues, and that some of you might do as well, into ultramarines and purples. Okay. Um, bluey, black. And the rest of my almost like turquoise blues, yeah. So they're all kind of a bit more together. And that one comes to them as well. So as long as you can see that difference, so we need more colors close to ultramarine. And their variations that could be called very differently. And even if you've got one blue, you can always add violet to it to make it uh, more into that color. Yulia, my my indigo is almost green. Do you think it's mislabeled? Mm, sometimes different manufacturers. What the uh, paint? Uh, it's it's uh, it's 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 the it's the um you know the white knights. White knights. Yeah. Oh no, it can't be green. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's it's really green. <laughs> it's green. No. It's always, 
No, see if you've got any other dark colors and check if there is any very dark blue. Yeah. Unless uh, sometimes when we unwrap it, we get mixed up. Or unless it's yes, there was a technical issue. Yeah, it shouldn't be green. No. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so that's more. Uh, let's label some of these ones. Green or. Um, Sky blue or fellow green or um, anything with green. Emerald green, really. Yeah, I've, I've obviously dropped them in the wrong uh, in the wrong place. Ah, OK. Have you found it? I, I think I found the one that's indigo, which is where I've. I've obviously mixed up the green and the indigo. It's fine. No worries. That happens. Yeah, they're yeah. just looking black at this surface. That's why we're checking them. That's why we're checking them as we go. And that's my indigo. So that's black and blue. So we have almost like three categories in our blues there. OK. And of course, we can make these colors much more concentrated and much more uh, diluted. So let's pick up one of our, um, one of your darker pigments. It could be ultramarine or any of the other blues, which will be the darkest ones. Maybe not indigo, so we can see the color. I'm gonna go for my ultramarine. And let's make it as dark as we can make it, as solid as we can make it. Okay. And let's gently dilute it and make it slightly more lighter and slightly more lighter. Okay, and perhaps doesn't have to be a specific order. I just want to see a little bit of that light coming through just by adding a tiny bit of extra water. And I'm dabbing on my paper towel so it's not too watery, not too runny. It also allows me to plan my how diluting my colors and can I get something off white? Okay. Another way of doing it is working into uh, a solid color and then moving towards um, washing the brush, getting a bit of water, wetting the surface and then just dragging that color a little bit out. Sometimes it's easier to do one technique or the other. All I'm interested to see how that concentration of paint could be controlled. Could it, can we see that change of darkness? Okay. And then how we can blend our colors together. So if we start with ultramarine, I'll make it slightly wider section so it's easier for us. And if I were to put a little bit of water in the end, and introduce one of my greener blues. Okay, I'll just put a more fresher one here, maybe merge it together, maybe overlap them. Okay, maybe go a little bit there, a little bit back to, to make them merge more evenly. And have a little bit of wa water again. And we can go a tiny bit more into the emerald green and merge it again with our earlier blue. And even on that side, we could have mixed a bit of violet, but I'm a bit too late for that, and that's okay. So that's how we're gonna build up our darks from the top of the sky to the horizon. We've got one cooler, well, not cooler, 
we've got more violet blue, warmer blue, and then we're moving into the greener blue and perhaps a lighter emerald green. Okay. That's going to be our plan for the sky. And for the mountains, we'll build, we'll, we will be building uh, some lighter, so perhaps lighter greens, greeny blues. For some of the lands and forests and uh, lower sections of the um, valleys. So if I were to build up um, just looking at some of the shapes of them, those valleys, some of those pale, pale greens, uh, bluey, blue and green mixtures. Now I'm putting them more as a shape in comparison to a blend here. So then I can contrast them with uh, ultramarine. Okay, as a slightly darker tone. If they blend and run into the shapes uh, into each other, that's okay. But if they stay separate, that's good as well. So let's say that might be one of the mountains there. And we can also add to ultramarine a little uh, touch of violet. And then our mountain suddenly will have a darker edge to it, a silhouette or shadow, more darker woodland, a blend of darknesses. So we have more soft merges of color. And we'll have a little bit more precise blends, not blend. Well, in, in wet and wet, there will be more blends, but they're, they're coming up as shapes. And just placing them in those patterns gives us enough understanding of the terrain. Okay. So lighter tones first, those greener shapes I applied earlier. And then I went for, so in a way I'm working from that area, moving to something here, moving to something here, moving to something more violet. Only because our greens are paler in the con in consistency. If you wanted to put something pale violet, that's fine as well. We can do that on earlier, st the earlier stages as well. Okay. And let's do a little practice for clouds lifting and how we can paint out. If I painted my mountain here more on a dry surface, there is a little bit of softness going on, but overall on a dry kind of uh, principle, we, we can see at least control yeah, where the color is going to go. Yeah, what's going to be light, what's going to be dark. But let's practice uh, the sky and then let's practice the mountains a little bit wet and wet um, with a wet and wet approach. Now we will be painting on a larger scale. So this is just a smaller practice. So if you do need extra paper, uh, pick up extra paper and um, maybe work on a slightly bigger scale. So what I'll do, I'm going to, so um, we will be building up our sky. This is sideways, but we're gonna do it uh, from top to bottom. From ultramarine, uh, sky blue, uh, to greeny blue, to emerald green, okay? But what I'm interested in at this stage is how we're going to lift everything, yeah? How we lift the, the, the clouds. 
uh, we'll manage the colors afterwards. So let's just apply something darker and lighter like we've done in one uh, of the samples, just for simplicity. I'm going to use a flat wash brush and I'll just make the surface here wet. So that will give me much more control uh, over the area. Um, because it's so much larger than that little segment. Okay. And then I can go with my other flat brush. I'm going to go for my ultramarine just to simplify everything. One color at a time. I will make it a little bit more complex as we get to the bigger piece. So stronger pigment at the top. I'm going to have a tiny bit of water as I'll apply the layers lower and a tiny bit more water to get that softness through. Now, while everything is wet, we can work over if we want to make it even. However, often, you know how we had that swirl when we were painting this, uh, drawing this swirl? So if I wanted to make a little bit of a directional strokes as I will be painting on a larger scale, that will be fine as well. So then we don't have that um, fence-like painting. And my next trick is to use a tissue, the edge of the tissue, and plan against our lines and lift some shapes. Uh, I've lifted a little bit. I'm going to turn the tissue and have a clean edge. I'm going to have a, a bigger shape of the dabs of the cloud, perhaps here. Now, if we do it too slow, um, I'm gonna turn again the tissue. Uh, if we do it too slow, nothing's gonna be lifting, or it's gonna be lifting very lightly. Sometimes that's a good thing, uh, sometimes not so good thing. Dragging a tissue will give you some fantastic marks, as much as dabbing. Yes. Yeah? So if I want something individual, and more precise and much more whiter, I'll need to do the dabbing. If I wanted to do more feathery strokes of much more higher clouds, dragging will be much more fun, okay? Much more natural in the, in the appearance. And the little close up, uh, clouds next to the mountains, uh, we'll do at a different stage. We have loads of light tones here, so we're not gonna really see them if we do them uh, right now. Especially here, my paper is uh, reflecting, it's very wet. So all I'm gonna do here, I'm just gonna dry a little bit of that paper. And I'll show you when it dries. So, from this exercise, all I want you to take is the direction of the paints we're applying, of the blue, something lighter and darker, darker at the top, lighter at the bottom, a bit more of a direction of the strokes. And then how do we lift? Uh, how quickly we lift or how much uh, time we, we leave uh, if we want to have much more gentle strokes. And in a way, you can have uh, a number of sheets practicing using different uh, tissue paper, uh, using different, uh, you can even use a sponge. Uh, so we'll give you a different, okay, that's probably a bit too late for a sponge now as well, um, but different lifting um, techniques come from using various quality paper. Okay. And what I wanted to do at the bottom here, maybe just to practice doing our mountains in a little bit more 
uh, wet on wet approach. So again, I'll need to uh, re-wet the surface because it's uh, drying now. So I'm going to wet the surface. Only going to need a little bit of color here, so I don't need much space. I'll use a um, flat, large flat brush again for one of the green and blue colors. And I'll apply it quite quickly as big shapes. Now, light colors could be applied and more wide areas than we need to. That is not an issue whatsoever. So somewhere at the base of my mountains, I just put a bit of green and blue. And then I can go for slightly darker tones, let's say ultramarine, it's still very, very wet. So I'm going to place it, um, I'm gonna dab the, pay, uh, the paintbrush on the tissue so it doesn't allow to run as much. So I'll have some uh, exciting shapes coming, but they're not adding extra water to the, to the paper. And then I'm gonna pick up a little bit of violet and ultramarine. Okay, well, the paper hopefully is still remaining wet. I can add more distant shapes. Everything is soft, yeah? There is no, uh, it's not running, but it's staying very damp. And that's dabbing on a tissue paper, gives me that control. And then using a, a narrow brush, I'm going to add a bit of indigo. I'll remember where my indigo was. Okay. Then I can add perhaps some more. Uh, and again, just double checking, I haven't got too much moisture. It doesn't mean that I don't need the darkness or the volume of the color, but I don't want it to run. And I can almost apply it in precise areas maybe for some of the shadows we can feel it's too runny i'll be using my tissue paper so i don't want that's much more of a um, um, stronger contrast i don't want that if that happens i just need a little bit of extra water or fresh color next to it so it blends okay don't want that as a line either. So this is a nice practice piece to just to, to test um, wet elements on our on our painting. Kind of having that control how much dampness is going to be here. If the lines become too sharp, what can be done? Yeah, can I soften them? Or can I just do a mark and stop? It probably will run uh, within a short period of time. And if I did want some extra clouds going over the areas, I can dab with the tip of my tissue. Probably circle, circular type of uh, marks. And from time to time, I need to change that point on my tissue so it will be clean and decide how much or how little we want to introduce of these clouds.
And if we can focus on something is less successful, can we work into that? If there's something more successful, maybe we'll leave it out. That variety is going to be here. We need to introduce a little bit of extra coolness to the sky or a little bit of uh, the blue. I can use my tissue as well. I'll put a tiny bit more water on it. And just lift it with the tissue. So let's say if I want to do a tiny bit of shadows on the lighter surface, that's a little bit too bold. So some of that could come up. And again, it has to be tried out and a little bit played with before we get into actual piece. Okay. So lots of fluffiness going on. Not quite happy with um, balancing of things, but more interested in softness and sharpness and how kind of the order of the pigment we're applying there, yeah? Plus, we're thinking it's distant mountains, so if they more obscure, that's fantastic because our trees and the green field will be more important at the end. So for any watercolour, especially wet and wet, those practice pieces, I might do one sky, two skies, three skies, changing the layout of the clouds, varying the tissue and the marks, varying the colour, and this is kind of the blend range of colors, uh, trying different kind of how big my, my paper is, because one thing we do in a small paper, another thing we do in a larger one, burying the mountains, working things out. So it's, it's a very quick painting, um, but it's a planning what takes um, time, okay? So let's move to our actual painting. So step number one, I'm going to do the sky only. I will paint the area with the water um, a little bit lower than the, the uh, silhouette of the mountains, but I'm not going to paint it lower than the mountains, Rich. Yeah, just, just in case anything, any color runs, it just will stay uh, a little bit lower. I don't want it on a border edge. So wet... Uh, brush going over the whole paper. The large brush gives us a quicker coverage and more even coverage. You're probably not going to see where it's finishing. Somewhere a little bit lower than my mountain line. And going a few times over just soaks the paper well. And because it's a larger paper, I think I might even need my larger brush to apply uh, my blues. So ultramarine is first. as uh, a darker tone. Now I'll go darker than I probably want it because water on the paper all, will dilute the color. I don't want it to be too light. And as we said, we're going to try to follow a little bit of the diagonal of the clouds we use. So that's top areas, but more ultramarine. It runs there, that's okay. I'm going to pick up my next color, my sky blue or fellow blue or any kind of green type of looking blue. Down a bit lighter. Okay, and then merging together, it's all coming, running together. And as I want it to be lighter at the bottom, I can still work into them quite quickly. As I want them to be lighter at the bottom, just diluting the paint. Just want to make this corner slightly lighter here as well. I can see how everything is picking up there. Uh, starts drying even a little. So my key point here is to keep mountains pale. So the merge of the sky is staying pale. And I'm going to pick up my tissue 
and work into the diagonal I've drawn. So some of the shapes build up some wider shapes. I'm going to keep turning my tissue. That's very important. And work into that fluffiness of the shapes. Need to be quite quick because things are drying here. And perhaps changing the directions here. Okay. I'm going to try to make my strokes uh, looking like a cloud as a body rather than just individual strokes. Okay, we need more a shape. You can see everything is drying there quite quickly. I don't want a lot of similar lines or widths, so be extra careful with that. I know sometimes it's tricky to avoid. Again, I keep turning my tissue. I want something a little bit more lighter here. As that one is no longer lifting. So I'm just moving it further. And I quite like some of these ones, right? That's drying as well. Quite quickly. Okay. And now what I might do, uh, some of my paint on the top dried very, very quickly and it is pale. I'm going to let all my sky dry and I might need to introduce a little bit of extra uh, darkness uh, for my sky. It uh, has settled too quickly for me. Right, this cloud looks a little bit lonely and so on. A bit too bold. So let's just break it down. That's better. So nice, whispery clouds overall. We work together. Uh, and I'm going to stop at that. Okay. So now the sky, the bottom part of the sky is dry to work into the mountains. So I'm going to use the colors we tested. Let's just bring them back here. So I'm going to use a range from um, purple and ultramarines to azure and emerald greens with blue to indigo to a little bit of um, uh, emerald green or just, just use it as a mixture really. So three groups of them all in one go. Again, perhaps um, watch me first. Let me just put those ones aside and then uh, work along. Uh, or if you want to work alongside of me, that's fine as well. Um, but I, I wouldn't be able to stop till the whole area is finished. Okay. Uh, now, if I'll put it more like this, so I can see part of it here still. So I'll start with all the lighter tones. So I need to plan uh, what are those lighter tones are going to be. So for example, the lake, okay? So the lake might have more uh, azure, sky blue in it. Uh, lower parts of the valley of the base uh, of the mountains might have more turquoise and greens and all the lighter tones. And somewhere maybe in between the valleys kind of as, they, um, as the darker mountains uh, go um over some of the lights and then i'll build up the darks so if from the for the sky we painted from top to lower layers here we're going to be just painting lighter to darker tones okay and i'm going to ignore all my pine trees as if they're not here and just going to paint over um everything except coming lower to our uh, green field here. I'm just going to dilute the colors as they're going further down. So where I can see the openings, I'm going to paint further. When I can't, I'll just gently dilute it. Okay. Uh, but I'll do it on the early stages. So I'm bearing in mind all these little elements in one go. That's why I have to talk through them, plan them, plan my actions, sometimes even double check or even do a few takes. So again, I need to start with a larger brush to make the area uh, wet. 
just check that you have a clean brush because I have used a pigment with it before. And this time I'm going to wet the surface um, starting from the ridge of the mountain. Okay, so it's not just random line, it's more of the ridge of the mountain so everything stays wet only in this area, nothing above. Okay, if I have too much water and it starts dripping below, I just need to support it. Okay. And more water here. And I'm going to go almost to the green field area. Mark it at the top, more free elsewhere. So everything is staying damp, especially the top areas there. Okay. And then I'm going to use my larger flat brush for color, starting from perhaps the lake. Okay, so let's pick it more intensively here. Uh, so my lake is, it has a flat uh, top line, but then there are mountains above. So that's somewhere there. And let's have a little bit more green with my paler blue. And there will be some more low areas. If they're going to run, they're going to run. That's absolutely fine there. Uh, as long as they don't run down. If they run gently, that's okay, like this one. Okay. If it starts running as a, as a line, then we've got a little bit of a problem. We need to uh, pick up some um, dampness. You can just dab your, uh, your, your brush on a tissue. Okay, just topping up my greens here. That's going to be a sharp, dark edge. So if I'll bring a little bit more green here, something around this mountain, maybe around here, behind it. It's soft. If at any point you feel that, let's say I haven't painted the tops of the mountains, but they're drying, I can top up a little bit of moisture, damp moisture, not runniness. Okay, now I'm going to go for a slightly darker blue, still more of a azure, so blue, blue, green, blue. And uh, now I'm going to be dabbing it on my tissue paper so I have more control so it's not running down or not spreading too quickly. So it's still soft, but it's not overwhelming. I'm more in control. I can create those little patterns and ridges, okay. So somewhere perhaps at the base of the mountains, maybe corners of them, maybe a little bit more of the distant ones. Something a little bit more further at the back. And now I'm gonna go for ultramarine. And again, the surface, I can still see it shines, so it stays damp. So it doesn't have to be very dark earlier on. You can do very dark tones right at the end. So I'm just, I've changed the color, but staying damp. So I'm very much in control because I dab my, my, my brush on the tissue. Okay, and I want similar type of width strokes. So I can vary that. Ultramarine. So once I've covered most of my mountains, I can start thinking of adding indigo or any darker tones to vary that uh, ridge. Sorry, to vary the, the richness of the of the tone. Okay, so let's have a tiny bit of indigo. And perhaps a dab of violet there as well. So this mountain could have more darkness. OK, 
Okay, maybe I'll support it a little bit more with some. Um, Right, I think my surface is drying quite quickly. A little bit more violet. Uh, I can definitely see all this is... So I haven't painted anything in front because I can see I'm going to be fighting the time to work quicker. Everything's still damp but not as runny. So gently building it up. Okay, this is very dry, so a bit of water or damp. Surface, that's better, right towards that little segment. And then I can work into the lower layers. I tactically decided not to paint the blues here, so I can reintroduce moisture. I think my paper is absorbing water today quicker than expected. Perhaps the room is nice and warm. So then here I'm going to bring again some stronger pigment for the mountains. Perhaps that island, the other side of the lake or another something rising. Over and then anything ultramarine with some violet with a bit of indigo. I want some darkness to come through. Uh, not overly dark because trees will be important to us in its silhouette shape. And as I said, we still need to do something behind the trees, not massively, but something. So what I'll do, I'll blend. I'll wash my brush, it's a bit too strong here. I'll blend that existing blue. So it's softer. It's not staying as a line, but stays softer. I'm happier with that. Okay, and now I haven't done my clouds, intention of my clouds, uh, because I was focusing on my mountains. So I can try them now. If they're not going to happen, I'm going to leave them out. I think I can just tiny bit introduce a little bit some of them. Uh, I would prefer to stay, keep my mountains sharp rather than doing some extra lifting effects. The wet on wet technique was more important to me than uh, introduction of clouds. Okay, that's good. I think that stays soft. I might just bring some of the clouds as a silhouette later on. Okay, I'm happy with that. So now the mountains in the sky are finished. Let's explore the colors for uh, the green field. And now I'm going to use a little bit of orange. Okay, any of your orange, or you can mix your own orange with yellow and red. And I'm going to pick up, uh, you can have emerald green. Now on its own, it's very um, strong and unpleasant, but if you mix it with orange, uh, we'll have a lovely um, color there. And I can also have more orange added to that. So that's more orangey side of the color. Okay. Or I can add a little bit of extra yellow. So if that's my fresh 
pen that's quite fresh yellow, but um, yellow and emerald green. And orange. So I'm not just mixing the emerald green with yellow, I'm mixing it with um, two of them together. So I have a lighter version of it and I've got yellowish version of it and I have more orangey version of it. Okay, I think that's what the good for our field, for the grasses. And for the trees, uh, we can have a similar green or there is another, uh, they might, you might have a hooker's green, kind of a duller, uh, almost already pre-mixed uh, orange and uh, emerald green. And we can add some violet to that. Okay, so if I'll go a bit more concentrated to greens, that's will be quite a dark tone. So that's some of the very dark shadows. But we can also use that uh, hooker's green. In St. Petersburg White Nights, it just calls green. So it might not be helpful to others who've got different makes. And I can go for any of my blues. If I mix it with a blue, any will be good. So that's, that's been extra cooler. I've got that emerald feel. Uh, for it. Okay. So what we're going to plan for the trees. So these are our trees. And that's our field colors. So the field colors will be applied quite quickly. And we can work into that um, quite spontaneously. And so but these are overall greens here. And we can uh, plan our trees as shapes as well. So first of all, if I were to pick up a color just to build up a tree, so any color for the moment, how do I build it up? Uh, using um, a, a round brush for the top part of the tree is easier. So if I do a longer stroke, and then I add shapes as branches. So that's almost my silhouette of the tree. I can just make it wider or narrower or just keep it all as the same shape. So I've got that body building up quite quite happily. Yeah. So that if that was my line, yeah, I just start at the top a little. I don't do the line all the way. I'm just showing you the principle here. And then something on the top and then just playful strokes maybe with gaps, maybe without, and then everything going that way, okay? Color-wise, what's gonna happen? We have light coming from the left-hand side. Now, on the photograph, the trees look very dark and almost black in places. Now, we don't want that. So we're gonna plan our trees with a lighter tone. So perhaps something uh, as our plain green or our uh, emerald green look. So plan-wise, it might have a little bit of some of that color at the top and maybe right, so left-hand side. So I'm almost doing half of the tree here, okay? And I might move it from um green to emerald green to so that's that's okay so i can just add that color to that and then the other side of the tree is going to have a dab of violet so i'm going to merge the two parts okay and the lower branches will have more shadows so they will have more um uh, violet or extra darker blue with green. So that body of the tree stays dark, 
but it still has variety of color in it, okay? Now, what will be different is that we have a lot of groups of trees. So again, the plan there is to have, uh, maybe even to have a little bit of orange. So if I have my field, let's say, and all my trees are staying, staying somewhere here, I need to almost plan where I'm going to have a little bit of light. Okay, somewhere here, maybe somewhere here. Okay, maybe a bigger group somewhere here of light, where this light is going to be. Because I'm going to paint most of the trees quite quickly together. Okay, maybe there will be another group of light somewhere here. Maybe I'll move from that color to emerald green by using uh, my other green and blue. Okay, maybe a bit more diluted. Okay, where are those shapes going to be? If needed, we can do a group at a time. Okay, so just need to make sure that they merge between themselves, but that's going to be a group at a time. So once that one's done, then we can go for our darker blue and green and green and violet. And then we can add other trees which might be behind them other trees or branches which might be parts of them so it starts becoming a very vibrant silhouette of trees so there is light and dark within those shapes okay and that wet on wet technique will be happening as you painting of course you will have some dry edges for this stage and that's totally fine and that's how we'll have some gorgeous um, silhouettes of the branches. But it's going to be built up quite quickly together. Okay. Now, if you feel a little bit rushed and not ready for doing it on a painting, I would prefer you just to practice it on a separate sheet first and maybe do it um, after the video is, is finished. Okay. So then you can come back to it. So practice, practice, practice before you do your final stage. Right, so I'm ready to paint the field now. So that's my lovely warm grass. Uh, so yes, I will use my wash brush again to wet the whole area together. There's a shadow there. I'm going to ignore it for the moment. I'm going to paint all of this area together. And because it's quite a, a big and simple, simplified uh, wash, I'm going to use the same big brush. I'm loading it with some um, orange. I'm loading it with some emerald green. I want to make that variety of lighter greens first. Okay, I can do a nice quick stroke, maybe some yellow with this mix because it's a big brush and quick strokes colors come in uh, quite intensive which is lovely okay all the way across and i want to pick up a tiny bit more orangey green for the lower part perhaps even changing slightly the direction okay how the pigment is running is quite exciting. That's all going to come in. But I have a nice dark shadow here in a moment. So the darker shadow might pick up stronger green, perhaps a dab of blue or violet, a bit of both. And I'm going to just plan this shadow here straight away and plan some of these. Uh, trees as a base because they're on the wet surface I'm just going to do a tiny bit of that color before it starts merging okay right so my field is done I'm happy with that uh, as it settles in I can start painting my trees as groups so I'm going to look for some of the lighter tones 
uh, first. Now, I don't have to wet the surface now, uh, but I will use my flat brush. Okay, let's bend it. So let's start again with a little bit of uh, orange and green. I think that orange and green is a little bit lighter. It's a bit more exciting for small volumes of the trees. So somewhere, so now I can see where my gap is going to be. So somewhere on the border here, uh, if I start with a pointy brush for the top of my pine tree, okay, so that's somewhere here. Uh, my, my trees, so my mountains are quite dark behind, uh, but it's not going to stop me to see the light green, okay? I'm picking up um, a wider brush um, as it's easier to cover the surfaces quite quickly. So let's do find a bit more of that orangey green in this area. Any other tops of the trees I want to keep light. Maybe something here, maybe another one somewhere there. And I just want to use a bigger strokes so I can paint quicker and even perhaps reach for the field, my green field. Let's stop on this small group uh, first. Now, now I can pick up my next green. So green and a little bit of blue. And anything I can add, okay, maybe a tiny bit too dark. So a dab of water. So the wet on wet technique is now building up here. Can I do anything on the left hand side of my pine trees where I haven't finished them or I can touch the ones which already have a full silhouette? I can add other trees. Just be careful how busy everything will become. Okay, I think that's a good go somewhere here. And violet and green or more stronger blue and let's build up a couple of depths here close to the edge of the grass let's build up a little bit of extra shadows for this tree because the paint stays damp it's very easy for me to come back okay, some small individual strokes some larger ones Okay, let's perhaps stop here. I can touch things up with darker tones, but if I want to have something soft, I need to do it now. If I want something sharp later, I can do it at any time. Okay, anything soft need to be done now. So concentrated paint, and occasionally I dab it on the tissue, so just checking how much runniness of that. Um, that brush still holds. Okay, let's do now trees which are here at the front. They will have more light tone. Okay, orange and emerald green or any other uh, green. So as long as we have a little bit of extra light there. Now, I'm not going to start here from the top of the tree. I'm going to think of the body as I've just been dragging it a little across. So the top of the tree is going to be more of a silhouette for me. So I'm going to leave that one be. But the lighter tone, perhaps it will stay on this tree. That's a little bit darker version of my lighter tone, which is good. Because I do want to see it as a silhouette. I want to see more... Uh, of the lake and the mountains further back. OK, 
Okay, maybe softer here. And I want to see a little bit of paler tone. Okay, perhaps somewhere here. Or maybe a diluted version of blue and green. So it's lighter tone, but it's cooler. Okay, so I've got this a little bit of a block. Okay, and I'm ready to work with darker tones. Okay, I'm picking up my smaller brush. Um, green and blue. And let's start with some of the silhouettes. Just test how dark it is. So perhaps my tallest tree first. So I'm making sure that I'm not going to go any higher than that. Uh, maybe another one. So I'm painting not one tree at a time. I'm painting groups of trees. I'm looking for darks and lights. Uh, there are loads of similar heights of trees. I want to vary it. Let's do one a bit more close. And let's do one a little bit higher. And I can still see my line for that V shape I wanted. So maybe there will be another tree somewhere here. Those are going to be more branches. Okay. Green and violet for anything extra dark. These areas are still damp. So I can offset the trees at the front with their shadow, with the shadows behind them. A little bit of dotted areas if they kind of light areas if they too strong I'll have paler green introduced over so they don't jump as bold highlights. Okay, is this area drying up? Okay, maybe I can work into that. Have another friend here. Okay, there might be a group of very low trees kind of going quite on the slope. They're much more further down. And again, maybe a bit of violet and green. I can still see green in it, so it doesn't appear black and where this shadow so if the left hand side of the tree gonna have more of a light maybe or oh, this shape gonna have more darkness gain a little bit of light a little bit of darkness combination again big blob off and um, i haven't worked into this area maybe there will be another tree quite softly showing some of the shadows Okay, this area is very dry. I'd like to come back to that. So I have warmth, coolness of light. I've got lights and darks. I don't have too many white little gaps. If I do, it's, they're balanced and how many. Okay, let's finish this area now. So again, some more green and blue. Uh, I can use now this lighter tone, almost like drawing around it, almost like finding the silhouettes of the tree and background. Okay, that's right run. So let's find that silhouette. 
Okay, so we start seeing the shape of it a little bit bolder, a bit stronger. And then the low areas, I can start introducing some shadows under its branches or between branches. I'm in and out of our greens, but varieties of greens. So it looks like this tree is partially in the shadow, partially in the light. A bit too bold, so I'll soften that shape. And let's do the same for this corner. This tree might find itself in more of a shadow here as well. At the same time, we don't want to tell too much about it. What I do want, I want to have more of a distant silhouette of trees. Right here, so that might be just a small woodland, really, really far. So I don't need to identify any individual trees. Uh, they're standing as a group. I'm going to keep a, a straight line at the base. Maybe even give it a slant. Okay, now this tree is a little wobbly. So let's balance it out with some shadows. This has a lot of gaps here. Maybe some pine cones, maybe a little extra details. Maybe don't have to explain what it is. Okay, that's looking good. And as the tree shapes dry, it's partially still damp, but as they dry, I can see the final true darkness. And with a slightly larger brush, I can come back. I think that one will dry slightly lighter than it is at the moment. But some of the other areas, I've got a line here. I don't want a line. So maybe I just tiny, tiny bit can touch things. Touch things up with a in between uh, orange and green color. Give them an opportunity to dry as a unity. Uh, work into this line of a field. I think I could do with a bit more shadows, perhaps here. Okay, that's good. And I think I could break down my field as we did uh, found and lost edges uh, for the mountains. I want to do the same for that line uh, for the woodland. So I've got a sharp line. I'm going to have a lost line suggested in tiny bit of water and um, softening that border. Okay, something a little bit more sharp, something a little bit more soft. Okay, and with my big brush, let's, let's have a tiny bit more. Darker orangey green. I think that's will work. Well, it's a bit too plain. So if I were to bring perhaps something extra to that. Uh, as a slope um, becomes more intense, yeah. Maybe that pale color is too strong so on. Okay, that's better as well. And that intensity of light here is quite good. Just gently a bit more. And I think I'm ready to stop. 
So there are loads of things going on in the last stage, and I can't stop when I work into it. I can break it into groups, and I can practice those groups. Another group, another group, maybe another group, another group, yeah. Um, but the timing, the colors going from one group of trees to another group of trees, uh, that kind of consistency uh, of uh, soft shapes staying soft elsewhere and only sharp uh, darkness is coming through slowly. Um, that's the tricky part, yeah? And that's what we can practice on a smaller scale and then we have to practice doing it all in one go on a bigger scale. Okay, so tricky technique for today. Um, as everything stays wet, let things dry before you're doing any final touches. So I'm going to be considering this area and comparing it if it's going to stay too dark. Maybe I'll need to support it. My sky is dry. I'm considering making a couple of darker uh, strokes for uh, this area, maybe as dark as this. Um, again, I'll let all the greens dry first before I do that. So less is more. So let things dry before you add things, before you fiddle. Okay. Sharpness is okay. Yes, we're doing a wet and wet technique. Sharpness and the contrasts are okay in smaller quantities, but overall lovely and soft. Thank you very much for today. I hope you had fun. And I look forward to seeing your finished paintings.